Hi, today we're talking with Brian Ludloff, the director of Livermore Valley Opera's production La Traviata. Hi Brian, Hi. how are you? I'm terrific, I'm Good. happy to be back in Livermore. Good. Um, so I'd like to talk to you a little bit today about uh, La Traviata and uh, what is it that makes your La Traviata production special? Well, a great number of things start, not the least of which is a terrific cast. Uh, um, Traviata is an opera I've done a lot and I always look forward to coming back to, you know, there are some operas you do over and over again and you don't mind leaving them behind, but Traviata is one of those operas that I always learn something new from and uh, this production has allowed me an opportunity to go back to the uh, text of the novel upon which the opera was based, um, The Lady of the Camellias by Alexandre Dumas Fils, and explore the story in a whole new way. Uh, uh, and the company has given me some liberty to uh, frame the story in a, in a unique way um, that includes some of the literary references. Uh, so without giving too much away to the audience, uh, um, uh, it will begin in a very different way. I, I'm fairly certain than anyone has ever seen Traviata before. Are you willing to divulge a little hint, possibly? A, a little bit, a little bit about it. Um, I, I was so struck by the descriptions in the text. You know, the book begins really with uh, um, the story after the heroine's death, mm -hmm. and uh, the ref the rest of the story is then revealed in flashback. And I have done previous productions where I staged quite literally what is described in the opening chapter, the, an, an estate sale, the sale of all of her mm -hmm. belongings, Marguerite Gauthier's belongings. And uh, um, that was kind of an interesting idea, but I thought, you know, how, how to make this more relevant to a contemporary audience mm -hmm. uh, um, that might read the book, and should read the book, by the way, uh, very easily gotten, a marvelous, marvelous story and a quick read, uh, and and how to experience that story sort of firsthand. And so I, w I wanted to see the story through a very contemporary lens, which is not to say we tell it in a contemporary way. Um, those of you who have come to know La Traviata and the wonderful 19th century costumes uh, and setting, you'll be that's what you'll be seeing. Uh, so you'll see a very sumptuous set and very beautiful costumes for the most part, but I wanted to be able to tell the story through a contemporary lens. So we start with a woman reading the story and uh, um, hallucinating through flashbacks the, the rest of the events of the story. So I think, I think we've come up with something uh, a little clever mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we'll see. Very interesting. So how are the, is the set design helping to tell the story and make it unique from other productions? Well, it's marvelous. Um, uh, I'm happy to be back working with designer Jean-Francois Revon, who I worked with on the Madama Butterfly mm -hmm. that I was here for a few years ago. And uh, Jean-Francois and I talked a lot about sort of the layers of the story. And you, you know, the story is set in uh, um, 19th century France, mid 19th century Paris specifically in and around Paris, in the world of the demi-monde, which is sort of a secretive, you know, demi-monde literally meaning half-world, a secretive, um, uh, um, uh, secretive world of courtesans and their rich patrons and the life that they lead kind of behind the scenes of otherwise rigid 19th century morality. Uh, so Jean-Francois has created this marvelous uh, design of layers of drapery and fabric that are sort of peeled back to reveal the hypocrisy of that morality and uh, and reveal the the layers of Violetta's life that are sort of being stripped away one by mm -hmm. one until the end she's left in a barren apartment uh, uh, with nothing but a bed to, to sleep in as she lays dying uh, and those those reveals the richness of those layers being kind of stripped away. Uh, he's done a really marvelous job in telling that story visually mm -hmm. uh, and scenically. Very interesting. Um, so tell me a little bit about the cast and the singers who are performing. Ter terrific singers, you know. Uh, um, any time a singer does a, a big role like this for the first time, there's always a learning curve behind it. And I'm delighted to say all three of our principal artists have done their roles before in other productions, so they bring so much to the table already in terms of understanding their characters. They're also being very uh, brave 
and, and willing to try some of the new ideas that I'm, I'm trying to bring to it as well. Uh, uh, so it's a marvelous cast, Rebecca uh, Davis as our Violetta. Um, uh, it, it is stunning in the role. So you'll meet her in a minute. Uh, a fellow ginger. <laughs> we have a cast full of redheads, so I'm, <laughs> I'm loving that. Uh, uh, and uh, beautiful Rebecca has a beautiful, beautiful voice. She's perfect for the role. She's the perfect age. She's a beautiful woman, beautiful voice, brings so much to Violetta and so much uh, uh, empathy and emotion. David Gustafson, uh, the tenor, singing Alfredo for us. He's, he's taken a hiatus from Alfredo for a while while he's singing some kind of, in, in opera, what we call bigger rep, bigger roles, a, a larger fock. Uh, so he's coming back to Alfredo and uh, bringing uh, uh, some great ideas uh, uh, with him. And then Torloff singing uh, um, the father of Alfredo, uh, Giorgio Germont, a marvelous, marvelous baritone, and mm -hmm. brings a real sense of authority and dignity uh, to the role of Germont, which is great. Yes. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. We're here with soprano Rebecca Davis, who plays the role of Violetta in our production of La Traviata with Livermore Valley Opera. It's my first time working with Rebecca, and I'm really, really delighted. Uh, every Violetta I've ever worked with brings something new and interesting to the role, which is one of the reasons I love coming back to the opera. Now, I've asked you to try some new ideas specifically related to the prologue and act three. Yes. Uh, um, now that the camera's in front of you and you can't lie, <laughs> yeah. uh, what, what, what are you thinking about this idea and where we're trying to go with it? I have to say, I'm really excited. I've, this is my fifth production of Traviata now, and every production I've done has been very traditional, which has been a lot of fun. It's my favorite opera, um, truly. I, I'm in love with the character of Violetta because of the path that she takes and the, the melting of the heart that happens in Act One and how she falls in love and and um, escapes kind of the life of this the courtesan and um, eventually has to go back to it, although she doesn't want to. Um, and also the fact that she is dying of tuberculosis at this time, putting this into the mix. Um, helps make her choices of to leave her love eventually um, for the good of his family. So what I love about this production is that there is this twist to it. It has the feeling of traditional parts to it because my character gets to experience who Violetta is in um, Act 1 and Act 2. And Act 3 I'm so excited to start working on. We haven't done it in, in rehearsal yet. but. I can't wait to, to see the nuances that are going to happen from being in, you know, another character than Violetta, but having kind of the hallucinations that she's going to be having and bringing this, um, the story of the novel into Act 3, where she, she might not be interacting with the characters. We don't know yet. Right. It's right. going to be I'm excited to find out, cool. too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, let, let me ask you, uh, um, I wonder if you share this view. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the title La Traviata is the, the fallen, fallen woman, woman. Yes. Or the fallen one, the fallen mm -hmm. woman. And, and it has so many layers. Of course, she's fallen out of the favor of moral society by virtue of being a courtesan. Mm -hmm. Then she falls out of favor with the world of the demi monde when she leaves the right. Baron for for Alfredo and comes comes back to that life, mm -hmm. but in a way I find her to be the most of all of the characters, the most morally upright, the mm -hmm. most because the biggest heart. she makes the biggest sacrifice yes. of anyone. Yes, uh, um, she never really asks anything for herself. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I think she, it, uh, and I think this is what probably what attracted Verdi to the topic in the first place is that. Mm -hmm. While she's judged to be an amoral woman, she actually has a very strong moral core. I wonder if you share Absolutely. that view, what you think. Um, I think she is, yeah, one of the, the biggest hearts um, in opera characters because of the sacrifices that she makes. And, you know, in that time period, women didn't really have a lot of choice into what um, they could go into. And I always imagined her coming in from the country when she was, you know, right. 13 or 14. and already having, um, you know, looking for a way out of uh, kind of a impoverished living and finding the theater and then eventually finding patrons who would take her out of that and into this world of the courtesan. So she's a very smart woman 
very well learned and um, also an entertainer in which courtesans had to be um, mm -hmm. to entertain their patrons. So um, I think she started out as this, you know, very innocent character and mm -hmm. was wrapped up into this world of the courtesan and, you know, maybe became a little jaded. But then Alfredo was the one, who, also from the country, who came and, and melted that and showed her that there was love out there for her and that was what she really probably always wanted. Um, so when, when she had to give him up for his good family name, um, that was very hard for her and she knew at that point her life was over, that she was going to die and not only from her illness that she contracted from being a courtesan, but um, I'll just, she knew her heart was dead as well. Do you, do you think, I, one of the things I love about her, you know, there are so many operatic heroines that are courtesans. Mm -hmm. That seems to be a good yes. marriage, a good mix. <laughs> uh, uh, but of all of them, she's the one that, that has the real redemption that is so self-sacrificing. You know, Manon, mm -hmm. uh, um, right. many of the others, they, did, they don't uh, seem to transcend the same way. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, do you, I, I agree. I yeah. agree. Are there any of those op other operatic courtesans you'd like to play? Well, actually, I just finished playing Magda, which has oh, a very brilliant. strong yeah. correlation. But um, Magda is not quite as jaded when you find her in Act One. You know, there's no. the, you always see the longing that she has to get out of it, and you. She's also has a, a wonderful heart in that she always she also leaves um, Ruggiero um, because of. You know he wants a family and she can't provide that for him um, but um, you know Violetta goes she just has a little bit more nuance than Magda has yeah. as f and there's more of a journey in her, in her character yeah I would agree yeah well Rebecca Davis is marvelous in the role of Violetta and for, if for no other reason you must come see her at the Bankhead Theatre in Livermore Valley Opera's production of La Traviata. And Brian's wonderful production. We're all very excited about it.